Thank you so much, Pastor. Uh, I was going to call you Lucky. Pastor Lak Yong, for leading us in our service. So good to see all of us here. And I think Pastor Lak Yong is the only one who wants to go back to school. No matter how inspiring the video is, nobody wants to go back. Bye, Pastor Lak Yong. And um, here we are, learning from the Psalms. The Psalms are wonderful. There are 150 Psalms. We are in Book 3. And Book 3 is not easy to listen to because it's full of laments. But just to say to you that today in Psalm 84, there's relief, there's reprieve, because it's not a lament. And so it all has to do with the wrestling, the struggling in our journey of faith. The songs that we sing. So first slide comes on. What songs do we sing here in Singapore, collectively, as a nation? So maybe once a year, we sing our National Day songs. Stand up for Singapore. Count on me, Singapore. We are Singapore. And perhaps the most well-known is Home. So I want to just ask you, do you know who wrote Stand Up for Singapore? Who wrote Count on Me in Singapore? Who wrote We Are Singapore? Right. It's Hugh Harrison. He's a Canadian. What on earth? <laughs> I mean, our national songs written by a Canadian. Yes, he was. Right? And Hugh Harrison was working for McCain Erickson, an advertising firm at the time, and they were commissioned to come up. Because the government was worried in the 1980s, by the 1980s, barely 20 years after separation independence from Malaysia, 65, we became uh, independent, that the bonding between Singaporeans was wavering. And so the concern for community singing, that community singing might be helpful and useful for nation building. And so this have now become classic songs that we sing at least once a year. You've been away from Singapore at any, for any length of time, either to study or to work. Somewhere along the line, you might miss this country, miss the sights and the sounds, the food, the people, the places, the things that brought meaning into your life and the meanings in your life you and me remember. You can never forget the things which are pleasant to you. you can never forget the things which are painful for you. And so, very important. And you think, the number one song is Home, I think. Do you know who wrote Home? At least one or two people know. <laughs> the first three nobody knows, and how did I know? I watched a documentary on it. And so, the words of, the lyrics of Home. Do you think we could sing this? Whenever I'm feeling low, I look around me and I know there's a place that will stay within me. I will always recall the city, know every street and shore, sail down the river which brings us life, winding through my Singapore. And here we go. This is home, truly, where I know I must be, where my dreams wait for me, where the river always flows. This is home, surely. All my senses tell me this is where I won't be alone. But this is where I know it's home. You should give yourself a big hand in. If we do miss Singapore when you're away from this country, you would sing that reminiscently, with fondness in your heart, with a sense of longing. You miss the sights, the sounds, you miss the people, you miss your family, you miss your friends, you miss your relationships, all those things. You ask, what's the difference when you read a psalm, and most of the psalms can be sung, when they long for Jerusalem? And so it says this, next slide. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. If only you could put a melody to it. Can we try this and use home? <laughs> How lovely is your dwelling place. Imagine you are Israelite. You're longing for God's presence, and God's presence is at the temple. He promised them that the holy God will meet them always at the temple. My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. And so you ask ourselves, if we could move ourselves from the human, horizontal, earthly and longing 
for places and people. What's the difference when we long for God? Vertically, divinely, spiritually. So one way to understand this psalm is that it comes in three parts. And the three parts are longing for God's temple, journeying to God's temple, because not everyone lives in Jerusalem, and they have to travel in from every corner of Israel to come and worship, and then arriving at God's temple. And you ask yourself, if I long for a country, we long for Singapore, whatever for, will Singapore love me in return? We long for the temple in Jerusalem. Does Jerusalem love us in return? Will God love us in return? And all those issues are there. And so whatever for is answered three times in the psalm itself. And what are the three times in the psalm itself? Verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house and were singing your praise. So is he referring to, there, there's in one sense, the professional singers who are always there in the temple. Is he, is he saying that he envies them, that he's far away, he can't be there singing with them? Verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. And finally in verse 12, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. So the psalm is full of blessings, which means if you long for God and you worship God at the temple, you are blessed. We call this the three beatitudes, the three blessings. And so if this psalm was actually sung, and lots of the psalms were actually sung, and they usually sing en route, en route to Jerusalem, singing on your journey. So have you ever gone on a journey as a family, with friends in which you sang along the way? Anybody? You're totally unusual now, Singaporeans. <laughs> it's quite normal. So I did the trips to Israel, led the field. And in the buses, every day they would go out, we begin by praying, reading a portion of Scripture, then we lead in singing some songs together. You know how, how strengthening that is? That you sing en route to a destination, Right? And somewhere along the line, I pray that God will give you that kind of longing that you're separated from your parents, you're separated from your siblings, you haven't seen them for years. I don't have to give you that opportunity because COVID brought it about. And some of us couldn't see our families for years. Is that right? And we long for them. And you sing that we're finally going to see him, see her, my dad, my mom, my brother, my sister. So you sing longingly. You sing resolutely, single-mindedly. No matter what the journey, however long, we're going to encourage each other to sing until we arrive. And when we sing, and, and when we arrive, we're going to sing contentedly and endlessly for the, for the rest of our days. That seems to be the movement of this psalm. But tr to truly understand the longing that he expresses, it goes backwards. It goes backwards because, remember last week, in Psalm 80, when we walk through Psalm 80 and learn from Psalm 80, 80, the person is calling for help and three times is repeated, Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us. Obviously, God's face has been turned from His people. So when God looks at His people, smiles at them, it's totally different. When God turns from His people and frowns at them, they face the horror and the terror of God. When He turns to them, they are blessed. And he says, restore us, O God, make your face shine upon us to save us, so that you can save us. And we say the context of that, have you ever asked for help? If you ask for help spontaneously out there, let's say, I, I don't know what help you, you had. And it could be anything. My wife and I were attending a wedding. As we got out of the car to go to a wedding, her shoe broke. Can I help? No. I'm not a cobbler. I'm the husband. I'm supposed to go to the wedding, the wedding thing. I'm supposed to say grace, so I have to go and she has to come back. So you call out for help. Either you get spontaneous help, right? It's spontaneous help of a stranger or the paid help of a professional. When Israel called out to God for help, it was calling out to the God who chose her out of love for her. She wasn't calling out for the spontaneous help of a stranger, the professional help of someone who is trained in something, she was calling out for help for a God who loves her. Now this longing has to be set in its proper context, its proper spiritual context. When he's longing, the context of that longing is this. The next slide, Deuteronomy. So I'm going to take you a few things. to draw. And now, can we read this together? And now, Israel, 
What does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. So here's God speaking to His nation as they march into the promised land to do what? To, do, to accomplish what God promised them to do. When you go into the land, I dispossess the land of all the, f the people who are settled there. Then you will possess the land. God has to dispossess it, then you possess it. And in that land, the centre, the headquarters of that land is the temple in Jerusalem. So God brought you out of Egypt for one purpose, that you will love Him, worship Him all of your life. So you're su supposed to love God with all your heart and soul. There are wrong ways to worship God and there are right ways. The wrong way to worship God, God tells them in Deuteronomy 12, these are the decrees and laws you must be careful to follow in the land that the Lord your God of your ancestors has given you to possess as long as you live in the land. So it's a specific land. They don't just go to any plot of land and stick their claim to them. God will show them the specific land. This is the land. You destroy completely all the places on the high mountains Usually, temples are set on mountains, on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. The nations, apart from God's nation Israel, worship man-made idols. You break down their altars, you smash their sacred stones, you burn their Asherah poles in the fire, you cut down the idols of their gods, small g, and you wipe out their names from those places. So our idols and idolatry, our man-made religion, is offensive to the true, the living and the loving God. Out of His mercy and His grace, He doesn't wipe the whole human race out even as we turn against Him. He set out to bless one nation through Abraham and Sarah. From Abraham and Sarah came this nation called Israel, made up of the 12 tribes. Then the right way to worship God. But you must not worship the Lord your God that way through images and idols you made with your hands and God will tell them through the prophets, they are dead and they are dumb, you made them. How can you make idols with your own hands and then you go and worship what you make? Doesn't make sense. Has no sense to it. But you have to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put His name there. So God speaks of a permanent place, no longer the moving temple which is called the tabernacle, a permanent place to that place you must go. There you bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your special gifts that you have vowed to give to, that you have vowed to give, your free will offerings. And please understand, always give God your best, the firstborn of your herds and your flock. When you bring, when you bring things which are not your first choice but second choice, you end up being like Cain who killed his brother Abel who brought a better sacrifice. So bringing your first, you, you give everything that's firstborn and first choice to God. You never give God secondhand things. I just go on a detour, right? I've been to enough church buildings beginning with our founding church and uh, <laughs> as a junior pastor, one of the rules, uh, hey, can you go and clean up all the rooms, uh, a lot of rooms on the second floor, third floor, etc. And clean up what? A lot of people gave things through the years. Lah. And I went there and said, yeah, they gave a lot of old furniture, old fridges. And I've told you time and again in the RPC, right? That's mistaken theology. You don't give your second-hand computer, your second-hand furniture to God and church. We don't want it. You give your first. Amen? Sorry, yeah. Are you still with me? <laughs> the church building is not a repository of the furniture you don't want. It is the collection of you giving your first fruits, which is your life. You never give God second best. That's very important. I'm coming to that very soon. And then it goes on. Next one. Read the last portion. Turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, which means from her birth as a nation, as God brought her out of Egypt, led her out through Moses to, and Joshua into the promised land. God always told His people, you give me your very best. It's 24-7 worship or nothing. It's all me or nothing. It's never me plus your man-made idols. 
That's the right way to worship God. The only way to worship God. So the language of heart and soul in the first verse, right, is not that he's trying to be poetic. I, lo I long for you, God, with all my heart and my soul and my flesh. He's not trying to be figurative. He is banking on, he's speaking about this love relationship that God desires and demands of His people. You always long for the people you love. Amen? You can't stop thinking about them. You can't stop wanting to be with them. So to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul is not just poetry, it's not just figurative language, it is love language. Once you understand that, every psalm, every portion of Scripture, so you must never do this. You must never get used to Mediocre worship. And what is mediocre worship? Thinking that God is satisfied with 70% of your love and your loyalty. Thinking that love is, oh, you upped it this year after the pandemic, you upped it to 80%. I've told you this many times, just use the analogy. If I go back and tell Mona, my wife, Mona, I finally realized I don't love you enough. And so for 2022, I'm going to love you 90% of the time. And Mona said, thank you, Chris, thank you. I always knew you'd give me more of your heart. You think any woman will settle for that? You think you'll settle for that as a husband? That your wife is willing to give you 90% of her heart and 10% she reserves for, for, for a former boyfriend? For the life of me. You won't settle for that humanly. Why should God settle for that? He is God. He created you. Every cell in your body is created by Him. Every organ is created by Him. Every breath you take is created. He's your creator. He's your ruler. He's to be worshipped by you. And you have no right, and I have no right, to give Him partial worship, mediocre worship. And that happens when you and me are still committed to idols. In the words of Tim Keller, your heart and my heart is an idol-making factory. Can you agree with the statement? Apart from the grace of God, your heart and my heart, your life and my life, is an idol-making factory. It's not whether you will make idols, it's when and how big that idol is going to be. So as we sit here, as I stand here, are there any idols in my heart, in your heart, that you need to repent of? If there's an idol, a person or a pursuit or a pleasure, so the idol could be a person, Die, die, I must have that person. A pursuit, if I don't get that PhD, if I don't get that job, right? a pleasure, if I don't enjoy this dose of pleasure today, all those things are idolatries. You never allow idolatries to sit in your heart because God wants your heart and your soul. Your heart can't cope with the love of idols and the love of God. It's not that you love God half-heartedly, is more, is more true that you love yourself fully. Want me to say that in slow motion for you? It's not that you and me are half-hearted in our commitment to God. You are full-hearted in your commitment to self. And because you are fully committed to self first, you will make idols to chase in your life. So make a small detour, right? Yes, we should be compassionate and tender that people go to things, public things, and then all of a sudden, an accident happens, a tragedy happens, and people get crushed and people die. But you need to ask yourself, why should we celebrate Halloween? For the life of me, why should Halloween be a global celebration now? Why? To celebrate darkness and devilishness. So the world sends this message under Satan to us, Right? It's okay to be fanatical about anything else, and Halloween is part of it, but please don't get fanatical about God. What is it that God has done to you that makes you give love and loyalty so easily, so foolishly, so undiscerningly to anyone who turns up as a potential idol that gives you a passing, fleeting experience of your identity, of your happiness? It's passing and fleeting. And so idols, you, we can't come week after week. I can't stand here week after week and have an idol in my heart competing with the true, the living, and the loving God. So never get used to mediocre worship. Always seek God. It's all or nothing. The next slide. 
and when it's unspeakable worship, unspeakable joy and celebration, when the faithful God meets His faithful believers. And for Israel's life, God told them not all Israel is Israel. There will be a pocket, a minority of Israelites who will love God with all their heart. So this is heart and soul worship. When the loving God meets His loving people, you know, when two things meet, what, what is it that you and I, as Asians and Singaporeans, are really caught up? So, it's November already. Holidays are coming up here in Singapore, around the world. The end of the year holidays, five weeks of holidays, school holidays are going to begin. You're going to go, as you go to different places, what's the first thing you look for on your holidays? Food lah. I mean, to be honest, you track down everything. And, and what's so great about food? Dai Dai must try, right? Here's the Makan Sutra. It's a slogan here in Singapore. And I do enjoy food, right? And so when you put the two things together, when a specific dish of food or something meets your palate, my goodness, the joy in that, the celebration, oh, oh, oh. That's why all the food programs, you just see the judges... Ooh, 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 and you go, ah, 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 ah. So when the two things meet and there's joy, a burst of joy, right, all your senses are engaged and all your senses are satisfied. That's wow. I've told this many times. One of the speakers we invited was Paul Tripp, right? And Paul Tripp, he's, he preaches the gospel, he teaches something really well, the depravity side of us. And then he also loves food. He's a good chef himself. And so... First night of the conference, you know, he doesn't usually eat before uh, dinner before he speaks, and that's his pattern. He says, oh, I usually eat after. I said, it'll be quite late, maybe at 10 o'clock when we finish our, our night here. Said, it's okay, it's all right. So what do you like? Seafood. So we brought him to seafood. And I mean, the whole world has heard of our, what's that? Uh, what? Chili crab, our chili crab. So we ordered chili crab. He took that mantou, put it in that thing. We told him that's how you do it. He put it in there. And he went back for the second one. I worship you, O oh God. <laughs> no matter how many times I tell that. When the two things come together, you multiply that inf infinitely. When the loving God meets His loving people, when the faithful God meets His faithful people, it's a wow experience. That's what the psalmist is, is expressing. So it's not right to go to Christian gatherings, Right? half-hearted, with no expectation of the wow worship factor. That's so important. I want to say something to you again and again. And we had a conversation with some, I had a conversation with some brothers after that. What am I so concerned and worried about? You've heard my heartbeat. That pre-COVID, we were like this. A bit nominal, a bit slow, a bit sluggish, a bit lam noir, a bit, you know, that's a Hokkien word for, yeah, tardy, lazy, sluggard. Right? In our lives, in our spiritual lives, post-COVID, are we going to return to that? I challenged you last week on that same point. Is there the longing and the excitement of coming together together? You did when we were restricted to 50 maximum. 100, you have to sign up for it. Then we gather, you sit in pockets of five. Then you cannot sing. Then we prayed. We say we'll pray about all these things. We are now back without restrictions. Amen? Hey, and how come you're late? <laughs> you're dying to worship, dying to get back, Pastor Chris. Enough of Zooming. The Zooming is gone. The shares have plummeted. <laughs> if you bought Zoom shares. Because <laughs> it's the time and season. This is the gathering. And this is a small picture of heaven. And it's not right from the Old Testament when God warned the Israelites, the Old Testament church, to the New Testament church, you know why we cannot be mediocre? I fast forward this. Because God's promise that we will worship Him forever has been completed to the finished work of Jesus Christ. It cost Jesus His life. Jesus died for us to make this gathering possible. A gathering of all nations coming to worship God. Think about it. So on Friday, I just had a gathering and, and Africans, Latin Americans, one person from Jamaica sat beside me and the most well-known Jamaican I started talking about Usain Bolt, right? All here, what do we have in common? We all name Jesus as our Lord. I mean, this Jesus, this, 
this person, Jesus, born in Bethlehem, died on a cross in Calvary. He should have been wiped out from history. But here is every race under the sun, 2,000 years later, gathered in the name of Jesus to worship Him. That worship has been, has been bought at the greatest cost to God. As much as God prepared the way, I will rescue you from Egypt. It's impossible to be rescued from Pharaoh. Pharaoh will never let us go. He rescued them. We will never possess that land. It's full of Canaanites. We are a bunch of slaves. We know nothing about warfare. Nothing about warfare. We've been slaves for 400 years. I will clear the land for you. All these mighty warriors will be cleared. So God does, He does the hard work of making the worship of Him possible. He will pay the price so that you will worship Him. And the ultimate price He paid, that the Holy God will be worshipped by former sinners, is through the blood of Jesus Christ. So never get used to second-hand worship, to mediocre worship, to superficial worship. And that means you pray to arrive here excited to meet God, hear His Word, and when you walk out from here, your life is more aligned with God. Amen? More attuned to the way He wants you to live. And so we carry on. And so, even the sparrows find a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. And there are two possible interpretations. Even the sparrow finds a home, even the swallow. So he thinks of this temple area. Obviously, it's not designed as close. They're open things. It's architecturally stunning, right? And the sparrow and the swallow find a place. And you know, for animals to procreate, they must feel safe enough before they can procreate. It's very hard for zoos to be able to do that because we take them out of their natural habitat. And here's the picture of the sparrow and the swallows finding a resting place, a safety place. And it could be, could he be embarking on this? This is spiritual envy. I can't go to Jerusalem and worship, but the swallow and sparrows can. Could it be spiritual envy? Or could it be spiritual assurance? If some, some beings, right, animal life, birds, as minuscule and unimportant as birds, can find resting place in your temple, how much more can, should we as believers find a resting place in your temple? Which one is it? Is it envy or assurance? Could be both. I really don't know. But the main thing is this. The main thing is the joy of getting there. And at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my God and King. So from the security of the birds, you turn the focus. Even birds could shelter there, procreate there at the temple. How much more the securer of our salvation, he will bring us there to worship him. And then he moves on. Moves on to what? He moves on to the ultimate guarantee of security. For at the temple, the important thing, even when they had the tabernacle, this is a meeting between two parties that should never meet. Who are two parties that can never meet? You think Putin could meet with Zelensky? Yeah, with lots of people in between them. If you give, give them each a dagger, would they stab each other or will they get soldiers to die for each other? It's quite different, no? My wife has a simple solution for wars. Hell, all the wars are fought by all the fellas on top, right? Just give them a dagger each. Lah. Then no need for thousands of soldiers to die. It's true, dying for men's ego up there. So, how does a holy God meet sinful people? God builds into a sacramental system, a worship system. And the worship system, the highlight is the altar. Where you come, Israel, Israel comes, confess their sins, their sins are atoned for, and the priest, right, sacrifices a lamb, and all, the, all their sins are symbolically soaked up by the death of the lamb. Only then can the holy God, His wrath is vanquished, 
His holiness is maintained, is satisfied. That's the only path for sinners like you and me to approach the holy God and be welcome, not be kicked out, not be struck dead, simply by the holiness of God. So the altar is all, all important. The basis of their salvation, the basis of their security becomes very important. The linchpin of how does a holy God welcome sinners without compromising, save sinners without compromising His holiness and His justice. So I do not know you have heard or read about John Rabbe, R-A-B-E. I take your minds back to World War II. And World War II is waged on two arenas. In Europe, Hitler and the Nazis. In Asia and Southeast Asia is waged by the Japanese Imperial Army. And the first place they go into is Manchuria and then China and then the rest of Southeast Asia and we're part of that. In the conquest of China, the rape of Nanjing stands out, stands out in all this terror and its horrors that we inflict on each other when we go to war. You know, there are supposed to be conventions in war, what you can do, what you cannot do, but in wartime, who, who reads the convention? Who abides by the convention? And so John Rabbe was there as a German with Siemens Company. Siemens was already there. And he saw the atrocities the Japanese was inflicting on the Chinese folks in Shanghai. And so he had enough connections at a high level with a few others to set up a Nanjing safety zone. And in Nanjing safety zone, they look back in hindsight and think that what John Rabbe did saved about 200 to 250 Shanghainese and Chinese from being slaughtered. So the Chinese still remember him as a hero. If you had a father, a mother, a grandfather, a great-grandmother who was part of that, survived that, your estimation of John Rebe would be thankfulness. But he was a member of the Nazi party in Germany. He so happened to be working in Shanghai as an expatriate at that time. He went back to Germany and wrote a letter to Hitler, handwritten, and told him that if Hitler could tell the Japanese not to embark in war with such atrocities. The letter never arrived or arrived and got torn up and he got thrown out of the Nazi party. Now that I tell you these other facts, John Rabbe becomes controversial. Yes, he secured the lives of 250,000 Chinese, but on what basis? Jesus our Lord died on the cross, secured our salvation, and there is no controversy about him. He lived a sinless life. He lived a pure life. He never did sin against God and against neighbor. He's not a member of any other party. He's just the Son of God who took on flesh for us. At that altar, you can be totally confident about your salvation now and forevermore. And so your assurance doesn't depend on how you feel today. So I don't know how you feel this morning. And sometimes your hormones lead you right up there and sometimes your hormones lead you right down there. If, you, if your assurance of salvation is hormone-based, then there is no assurance. And here is God telling you, look at the altar, you look at what I do at the altar. Your sins confess, your sins paid for, your sins atoned for, and my anger turned away, and my holiness satisfied. Come and worship me. That happened at the cross of Jesus Christ. No controversy. A sinless man took your sins and my sins. So that is his confidence. That's why I'm daring, and that's why I'm longing to go to the temple of God. And when I go to the temple, He will surely welcome me. And I can sing praises to this God. Have you ever gone to a place in which you're uncertain of the response? Have you ever gone to your parents' place and say, I, 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 I don't know whether my father is going to welcome me or throw me out? And some of you could have strained relationships with your parents, strained relationships with brothers and sisters that you never know when you turn up in their house whether they're going to say, get lost. Oh, Welcome. When you go to God's house, you're always welcome. 
because of the worship system, because of the altar, the confidence of your faith. Right? And then it goes on. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. In his heart are the highways to Zion. As they go to the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. I want you just to notice at verse 7, right? It's firstly plural, they go, and then each one. That means this worship of God is both collective and singular. Then you need to worship God personally in your life. You need to worship God together with God's people. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. And very quickly in summary, this portion is about their journey. So they sing longingly when they are separated from the temple. They now sing firmly, single-mindedly for this spiritual journey. And they strength from single-mindedness. The next slide. They're going to come to this place called the Valley of Baca, and the scholars, the commentators have two views. Either this Valley of Baca is a real place, or this Valley of Baca is figurative. If it's a real place, right, it is known for, it's a valley of weeping, a valley of tears. It's known for its dryness. Most of the Middle East, most of Israel is really dry, but this one is super dry. Super dry means you walk for kilometers on end, you won't find an oasis. You will not find another watering hole. I want to ask you, uh, we're modern day people. How far have you walked and you ran short of water? Before you started to be desperate, before you panicked, and before you died of thirst. Everywhere we go now, you're either bus, MRT, car, if you go overseas, plane, boats. In the ancient world, everywhere they travel is you walk. Our visual display, Mona and myself, our visual display was going to Africa, Rwanda, Kenya. So poor, public transport almost non-existent. Everybody walks. Your children walk kilometres to school, walk kilometres back. You walk to work. That's why they are the best runners in the world. You think of travel, you think, oh, grab or no grab. That's your thing. You never run short of thirst. When you walk, there's no pipe water. You look for places of water. The valley of Baca was drier than dry. You go there, you might die. But notice the language that's used here. In this dry place, the circumstance is dryness, aridity, in the words of one writer. In a place of aridity, they have, they turn it into springs of hope, springs of joy. So their attitude in that place they don't say to themselves, thus says our circumstances. Our circumstances says to us, you led us out here to die. Which generation said that to God? You led us out here to die. Moses' generation said that to God repeatedly. They grumbled to God. But this new generation of Israelites years later who have now possessed the land, and seeing that what God promised, He delivers. What He promised, He delivers. You can bet your life on this God. He says something, it will be done. Not tomorrow, but in His time. They now long for this place of worship. They have to pass through the valley of Baca. They must never say, thus says my circumstances, so I grumble against God and give up my faith. I say, thus says the Lord over my circumstances. It springs of joy. It's an attitude. And so could it be? That this is it. We go back one slide. Strength from single mindedness. You face adversity with assurance and increasing strength from joy of arriving. That's so important, brothers and sisters in Christ. So I do not know that you could be facing adversity at this moment. And you could be on the edge of saying, Thus says my terrible, painful circumstances. Or you're going to turn around and say, Thus says God over my circumstances. There are two different things. And even a period of weeping, a circumstance of adversity, can be turned into, I will not give up on you, O God. I can bet my life on you. And we will arrive unhindered in our worship of you. 
And I want to ask you, as you look for strength, they go from strength to strength, right? When are you strongest in a journey if you walked? At the start, la, at the end, already. <laughs> and so, who, which kinds of people have an extra burst of energy? Marathon runners. People who climb mountains. You know why? Because the very thought of the destination, the very thought of finishing energizes them. Could it be this is the spiritual adrenaline he's speaking about? The very thought, I'm going to arrive in Jerusalem and unhindered when the faithful God meets his faithful people, when the loving God meets his loving people, wow! This is an experience as never before. The love of God, the forgiveness of God, the acceptance of God, new life. Wow! And it's rejuvenated in that. And then how does it end? Not just the journey, but the arriving. And so we read this. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So he has a choice. You gave me a choice? I'll rather... Right, just one day in your courts is, is better than a thousand anywhere else. One day. I would rather be a doorkeeper, a nobody, than be somebody in the tents of wickedness. Verse 11. For the Lord your God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing to see withhold from those who walk uprightly, O Lord of hosts. You know what I miss? I miss the, the verse in bold. And why is that there? Behold our shield, O God. Who is the shield? And who is the anointed? In all likelihood, you have to understand that God gave Israel a king and the purpose of the king, he didn't intend to, but they asked for a king because they were insecure. And the purpose of the king, political and military might that he exercises, is for the spiritual well-being of his people. So protect the king, and the king will protect the pilgrims en route to worship in Jerusalem. The next slide. So, protect the king, protect the pilgrims. So they finally arrive in this journey. As incomparable worship, you weigh the rewards of wickedness versus the rewards of faithfulness. Do you know you can be rewarded even though you're sinful? That sin brings success? That disobedience to God brings rewards in life. And that's why Psalm 1 begins with, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of the wicked. So you choose either the way of the wicked or the way of the faithful. Whether to enjoy success from turning away from God or success from living under God. For 150 Psalms, that is the choice. So have you heard of, have you heard of Tyndale, William Tyndale? You could have, because he was the first to translate the Bible into English. 1500s. For a thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church had reigned supreme in Western Europe as the only church. But the Roman Catholic Church then had turned corrupt, bankrupt, bankrupt morally, but rich materially, because it's soul salvation. You want to go to heaven? You must pay, pay, pay. So buy your way into heaven. God raised people like Martin Luther, John Calvin, and the idea spread from Europe to England. William Tyndale was so, was so influenced by these ideas. Go back to the Bible. I can now read it in the original language. So he translated it into English. He wrote a paper, and first paper that he wrote, one of the papers that he wrote was, the head of the church in England shouldn't be the Pope in Rome. The head of a church in England should be the king of England. And that was good. It so happened to be King Henry VIII. Two years later, Henry VIII went to divorce his wife and marry another woman. And William Tyndale said, that's wrong. And that's when Henry VIII, the king, came after him. Track, he was on the run. William Tyndale was on the run. He tracked him down, found him, sentenced him to death. And he died by strangulation. There are many ways in which they, in, they inflicted and imposed the sentence of death. But William Tyndale never turned, never recanted. He held fast to God and to Jesus. The history of God's church from the old to the new, exemplified in the Psalms, is you have to choose. Either you want to bask in the success 
of disobedience, sin and wickedness. And you will have that temporarily or you want to bask in the success, the reward of being faithful to God. Blessed is the man who trusts in you. And so we said earlier, it all finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus. Then Jesus is the temple, the new meeting place between God and us. Amen? How do you know that? This passage tells you that. In the words of Jesus himself, in John 2, 18. In John 2, 18, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, you destroy this temple. Destroying the temple was not anything that would cross the mind of an Israelite. And in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? Are you a master contractor, a master builder? And Jesus says, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And then they believed him, the scriptures, and the word that Jesus had spoken. Notice when did they believe? When did they turn the corner of belief? Because at the foot of the cross, they all abandoned him. It was when he was raised from the dead. Then they believed. The new meeting place between the holy God and sinners is through Jesus. The death, the resurrection of Jesus. So we read Colossians 3 in responsive reading. Set your hearts and minds on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Remember that? There are four things about Jesus you need to know for your everyday living. The death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus is seated at God's right hand, and Jesus' return. He's surely coming back. There's nothing more certain than the coming back of Jesus. More certain because He has promised. And Colossians 3 verse 5 onwards says, You seek God with all your heart and mind, soul, verse 1 to 4 and 5, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. It's the same message. You can only worship Jesus after you get rid of the idolatry of sexual immorality, pornea, and every other sin in your life. So you say you love God, you long for Jesus. Your love for God and longing for Jesus is expressed and experienced in your hatred for sin. Your love for Jesus and your longing for Jesus is expressed and experienced in your hatred for sin. If you don't hate your sin, you cannot presume lightly that you love Jesus because he died for your sin. So how long more am I going to entertain this pornography in my life? This covetousness for sexual immorality in my life? How long am I going to entertain the anger, the rage, the malice, the slander, the gossip? How long? The two things cannot reside in, their own, in one heart. The worship of Jesus and the idolatry of self. And that's why we ch I chose Colossians 3. We seek God with all our hearts. We long for Him. So what does that mean for you and me in ending? What do we get for longing for Jesus? Sins atoned for, God's will come. Jesus is our King. He's both priest and king. Priest in which you can be totally confident the work at the altar is absolutely done. King in that He's going to make sure that you are going to worship God forever and ever. No one's going to take you away. And so you just come back from preaching in, in, in Australia. And one of the men I met is a refugee from Somali. Came with his mother, found refuge in a new country. But I know how hard it's, it is to adjust. And his mother passed away when he was young. When your parents are gone, who do you find is your new family? He had nowhere. He was just on the streets. He found it in gangs. And then he spun into drugs. And then the two things fed each other. One day in a gang fight, somebody pulled out a screwdriver, got him here in the face. A scar is still there. He thanked God that he didn't get him here. He would have died. Teen Challenge, a Christian drug rehab work, got to him, shared the gospel with him. You know when he speaks with me, last week I spoke about another man, beaming with thankfulness to God, thankfulness for Jesus, that he can come and to this conference and listen to God's word. I don't know how much education he had, but you could see all the men from Teen Challenge, all different backgrounds, all different colours, just listening intently for the new start God has given to them. 
And what does he say to Mona and says to me, I never want to go back to those drugs. I never want to go back by the grace of God. He loves Jesus. He hates sin. But that's for drug addicts, former drug addicts. I'm not a drug addict. You are not and I'm not. You're just a sin addict. Sin has many faces to it. And don't you dare think that the drug addict is worse off than you. Whatever you are addicted to, your pride, your ego, your insecurity, your unforgiveness, there are tons and tons of it. They can't rest in the same heart of the worshipper. It's all or nothing for Jesus. You either love Him and hate sin, or you love your idols and you abandon Jesus. And that's so important. So do you ever listen to the announcements? The announcement is extra sleep time. You know our children's church is asking for helpers. You read in Deuteronomy, we're supposed to believe this and pass this on to our children, right? And God has blessed us with 600 children. We need more helpers in children's church. Do you think you can step up to this? Yes, go and pray and participate in this. Out of 10 churches in Singapore around the world, maybe only one is growing in numbers. I'm not exaggerating. Two, in many churches, the weddings are shrinking, the children are shrinking, and Sunday school is closing. Not the children are shrinking, but fewer children. Children don't shrink. <laughs> and so I keep reminding the pastors, the elders, the kids, and now I remind you as a congregation, we have a lot of children here. Praise God. Amen? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear any amen. <laughs> Those watching, I'm trying to get an amen here in my own church. There are many children. Do you consider them a blessing or a nuisance? Now I'm looking at the camera. <laughs> I dare not look at you. Do you consider children? When we have all age services, are all age services, some, some adults have told us through the years when we have all age services, that means the children join us here, etc. I'm not going to come, no? Or they send different messages. Because so childish. Like... It's childlike, it's not childish. Jesus welcomed the little children. So the kingdom of heaven will include children, amen? Or you just want it to be all old folks? <laughs> it's not for you to tell. So God has blessed us with 600 children coming back at Bishan and Adam. 1,000 on the roll. Another 400 will join us sooner rather than later, from being babies to toddlers. We need help on a Saturday and Sunday. Can you step up to it? We are particularly praying and looking for men, men, all those who are men, those who are not sure, come and see me. All those are men. Five days a week, number one people who teach, 70-80% of our teachers are women. Nothing wrong with that, it just so happened to be dem demographics. But I just want to say to you, right, when I was growing up, out of 10 teachers, seven of them were men in the 60s. Today, 40, 50 years later, it's reversed. Five days, the main teachers around our schools are women. They come to Sunday school, the main teachers are also women. What's the... What's the unintentional message you send to children, only women can teach. Men are useless. Men don't teach. It's beneath men to teach. we got to remedy this, brothers and sisters in Christ. I preach the truth to you. Right? So we've got to do this. By God's grace, the number of men is increasing. I'm looking at Karen Liu and the, we are increasing. Can we get it to 50-50 that 50% of our teachers are men? Amen. This Presbyterian church becoming slightly charismatic is okay. Right. And then show a model of this out there. A ministry that does a lot of hard work, almost continuous throughout the year, 52 weeks is our children's church. So we've been thinking about it pre-COVID, that every other ministry rests, you know, boys brigade rest, girls brigade rest, we do 40 weeks of that. Our youth ministry rests during June and during December. Do you think our teachers need a rest? You must say Yes. They do. And so we're going to implement it next month that in June and December, we don't like the word, they take a break. Give them a sabbatical rest. For three weeks in December, right, our teachers have a rest. Is that good? They'll come back refreshed in January, loving your children, teaching your children, raising them. But your first duty, you as the parents, you have the first accountability to God for raising your children. We are merely partners with you. So come December, what can you do? When there's no children's shirt, huh? no children's shirts, die lah. That means you don't know how to raise your children spiritually. 
We are only partners for one day in a week. We pray for them throughout the week. You must learn to look after your children's spiritual hearts and welfare. We can take breaks for six weeks in the year. Is that possible? So you either bring them out there and have your quiet times out there, go to East Coast Park, talk to them about birds, God created this, have your devotion time, right? You bring them here, wherever it is. Can we give our teachers a sabbatical rest so they'll come back refreshed? These are all the ways in which we will long to worship together as the people of Jesus Christ. And that's so precious for us to know. And what is so precious about this? You go. And we speak about this, this heaven. I'm going to show you two slides about the lyrics that, that caught my attention. Okay, you go on. Lyrics from a song, nothing else matters. You know there's a world, a world that Jesus is bringing us to where love is true, a world where no one lies, a world where hate and anger are unknown. When friends and family don't say goodbye, one day you will say goodbye to your father no matter how much you love him. One day you say goodbye to your wife or husband no matter how much you love her. A world where Jesus is on his throne, that's the world. We look forward to that world. We sing longingly for that world. Amen? And what else do we know about this world? It carries on. Next one. It's a world where shadows are gone. No more night. The sun will shine. All the wrongs made right. All sin and darkness is gone. Death is gone forever. Forgiven, free forever. Goes on. Next one. A thousand years seem like a day in this world. A flash of time compared to what's to come. We'll touch, we'll hear, we'll, we'll taste, we'll see. All senses engaged and all senses satisfied. When the faithful God meets His faithful people, when the loving God meets His loving people, creation new will be at home. We started with singing our home a song for Singapore as home. But no matter how great our cities and our countries are, there are no comparison to the true home in which there are no more sin, no more disease, no more death. Because Satan is no longer there and God and Jesus is there forever. It is to this home we will go. And three things we do in ending, sing longingly, sing single-mindedly and sing contentedly. Always for Jesus to stand and sing together. As the musicians make their way here to prepare our hearts and our souls for this. Spend some time in reflection as I lead you in prayer. Forgive us that we are so prone to offer you mediocre worship. And you have always told your people from the Old to the New Testament never to do that. And you have told us so clearly in your word there are right ways to worship and wrong ways to worship. And all our man-made ways of worship, the idols that we make with our hands, amount to nothing in your eyes. The right way to worship is to worship you alone made possible by the greatest sacrifice that you fulfill at the altar and the cross of Jesus Christ. To Jesus we turn and pray for your spirit to nourish in us, to unleash in us such a longing for you, such a desire for you, that there will be such a meeting, such a wow, when we worship you, when the faithful God meets his faithful people, when the loving God meets the people who love him in return. We pray to do this. We pray to sing songs that are focused on Jesus, longingly, single-mindedly, and contentedly, forever and ever, of our true home. There is indeed a higher king, a higher throne. Amen. Thank you.